Good morning. Uh, today we are almost at the end of the lectures and uh, the topic today is bimodal experiments, which is uh, a little bit different kind of imaging experiments. And uh, it also produces new challenges and new types of data. And uh, let's see if this one is around. It doesn't. So now it works. As usually, we have some literature to take a look at. Um, in particular, now there is a lot of books around image fusion. It's a popular topic. And uh, also this book is, um, I don't know if I meant last week, but image registration. There's a whole book on that topic. How to do the registration, different methods, under di which conditions, etc. And um, the second topic today, is uh, software engineering and also a couple of um, uh, things to read. This is um, a quite good overview of everything you should think of if you are working with um, software development for scientific uh, purposes. Maybe more written towards um, software development teams, but there is one or the other thought that is relevant for everybody. So, we have done a lot already. As you can see, we are now at the second but last uh, lecture. And we have done everything we can, more or less, with the images. Uh, also looked how they are created, where they come from, which problems that can occur, looking a bit into statistics and uncertainties. And um, now, just pull those down. Now we're coming into the topic of uh, image and um, to begin with, we may have done some images. You realize, okay, I get some of my information, but not really all. And uh, sometimes it can be quite ambiguous what is the reason for the change in um, gray level in the image. So here are a couple of different um, examples that I have pulled out from the experiments we do. And uh, one is hydrology in soil and geology, where you have um, water going into a porous medium. Problem is, in some cases, this porous medium is swelling and changing the geometric structure at the same time when the water enters. So you don't really know if the change is due to the structure change or due to the added water. Um, then we can also um, use it in cultural heritage for better segmentation accuracy, better classification. Uh, that is the content so the changes could be, in this case, wood that is swelling when it's getting wet and shrinking when it's drying. In uh, material science, it can be a question about uh, of the modality could also be that you have ambiguous readings, that um, you also don't know really what is the reason for the change in attenuation coefficient. Maybe the two materials are too close to each other in the gray level distribution. And um, when you select a modality, you have to balance between the good and the bad between the two. So a good modality would have a good transmission, good contrast for what you want to see. You should also be able to see the relevant features, so you should be able to resolve them. And um, you should be able to also identify the materials. On the other side, of course, we have, actually just uh, flipping the coin, uh, low transmission, so you can't really penetrate the sample. Low contrast, material combinations may be too close to each other. And uh, maybe not all features are visible for different reasons, could be the contrast, but it could also be the resolution and uh, the overlapping response that you are not able to separate them. So until now, we have only used one modality and hope that that would be enough. Uh, the next step would be to use bimodal image to extend the range of operation of your imaging experiment. Could maybe also 
chain extend the spatial and uh, temporal coverage. That could be that one modality is good at doing high resolution measurements, while the other one uh, can show some of the changes you want to see, but um, not may maybe not with that high resolution. Uh, reducing the uncertainty, I have said a couple of times already. And uh, also with the reducing the uncertainty, you increase the reliability of your investigation. And with that, you get a more robust system uh, performance. A little bit the idea of the multispectral glasses that they uh, use in the movie National Treasure, looking at different colors to see different features in, in, um, in the print. But that would be also the same thing. You're looking at with different glasses and you can see different things. And that is the idea behind the multimodal Im imaging. When you do an imaging experiment, you have different players. Um, first of all, you have your application, which is pretty central to you, mostly, unless you are a beamline scientist and want to develop your instrument. Then you have some physics for the um, interaction between your application and the, uh, and, um, the, um, uh, the sample that you want to in investigate. The acquisition is also it's a technical component where you um, need to make sure that the optics and the electronics can actually do what you want to do. And finally comes the processing and all these pieces must work together in order to have a stable uh, solution. And uh, looking at some modalities that we can think about, X-rays, most people know. Um, here you are essentially sensitive to uh, the density changes in the material. And of course, heavier materials have um, higher attenuation, and that means you can penetrate less of those materials. With neutrons, it's a little bit more chaotic. <coughs> It's not really related to the density, but more about the configuration between uh, protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And that can give... Uh, fortunate combinations give good transmission, unfortunate combinations give high, high um, attenuation. So that gives us a very different uh, field, and that can be used in many experiments where we combine the two modalities. Uh, one exam very good example is hydrogen. The lightest element has a quite high attenuation with neutrons, but you don't see it at all using X-rays. So that is the motivation to use the two. Um, in many experiments, also lithium for batteries is also a good component, which we also trace. And uh, we actually do bimodal experiments on on batteries and on fuel cells, uh, porous media examples, et so and so on. In other cases, maybe just about you can't come through the material, like uh, many of the materials here, like lead, gold, etc. You have longer penetration depth with the neutrons. But yeah, there are other sites where the neutrons are not so good. So it's you have to select it in a way that you can use it correctly. Another example for medical imaging is that you have your x-rays, but you can also have MRI and have PET and so on. Learn new information about the patient. So um, the x-rays essentially only give you structures, um, but you can also get functional information from uh, MRI, seeing how the the brain reacts under different uh, stimuli, and so on. So here you can also map. And uh, the thing is, with um, PET and SPECT, you don't have particularly high resolution, so it can be really good to have the guiding information from, for example, the X-ray. And that gives you the structures of, of, the, of the brain and the cranium. So in this way, you can combine it and have a better guiding uh, to uh, do your diagnosis. Another one is work with grating interferometry. It's a um, different way of using the radiation. So um, you're using uh, the wave properties of the beam, 
could be x-rays, could be neutrons. And uh, with that, you can get phase contrast instead of just transmission contrast. You can also get dark field contrast, which is uh, essentially telling about the scattered um, information. And with that, you can measure structure or distributions of structures which are below what you can resolve with the pixels. You can actually, with the... Uh, get information that goes down to 10 or 100 nanometers, statistically. But um, you can tell that in this region you have these sizes. Further, spectroscopic imaging is actually using the same modality, but you do it with um, high-resolved energy resolution. And with that you can also tell more information about the sample. Uh, in particular, if you have um, crystalline materials, then um, you can see uh, brighter reflections at different wavelengths, and from that you can do material characterization, seeing if you do transitions between uh, different uh, species of ion, for example. Or I recently had a user who looked at uh, lead batteries who saw how the electrolyte changes the, the lead oxide compositions through this uh, multispectral approach. And um, then, of course, you don't have to work with uh, the same dimension. You could, for example, work with a single, uh, so a three dimensional image, combine it with scalar measurements. So you have just point measurements of uh, temperature for example. So with that, you could also think about looking at temperatures, flow rates, pressures, and match that with uh, your decision in, um, in the images and see how things uh, propagate. So um, now I have told you uh, many ways that you can get information, but now we want to actually combine it and uh, the fusion is, in principle, a way to combine the data from different um, sensors or even data derived from different sensors and uh, represent them in a single common framework. And the idea is to improve the quality of this information so you can better um, tell something about your sample than if you would comparably just to compare with single, the single modalities themselves. So you want that one plus one is more than two. And there are many fusion approaches. And um, when I started working with fusion, uh, my, um, my former boss, he always wanted the golden recipe. How do you, have you found a solution how you can solve um, the fusion? No, there is no single one, because you, depending on what, what you want to do, there are different uh, approaches. So you could do the full multivariate fusion, where uh, let's say you have two images and you really compare them pixel by pixel, saying that together these two pixels, they deliver some new information. But you can also use augmented fusion, and that's something like uh, with this um, um, medical example where you have one high resolution and one lower resolution. The high resolution tells you about the structures, the lower resolution tells you about the function, and if you fuse those, then you use one to augment the information in the other one. And um, another use is artifact reduction. You may have heard about metal artifacts in tomography. Um, very common problem that the patients have uh, implant, metal implants, and when you do a CT of those, you have horrible streaks that destroy actually information that you want to see. Uh, in particular, for those who look at um, uh, bone implants and see how they really grow, attach on, on the bones, it's very hard to see what's happening in the few millimeters that is, very, uh, that is close to the metal that because of these artifacts. So with that, we can use the other modality to fill in the blanks and improve the knowledge in that way. And of course, as always, we can always combine 
all um, or some of these um, fusion strategies on different steps in order to get the, the final combination. And um, what kind of fusion strategy you're using depends on what kind of sample you have, what are your experiment objectives, and also on the condition of the data. So you have to decide from case to case or from type of experiment to what kind of fusion you want to use and under which conditions and so on. And the fusion can be done on different levels. Until now, I have mainly talked about data-to-data -data fusion, but you can also combine it as data-to-feature fusion. And um, in that case, you, you're looking at features in the images that you try to fuse instead of just the pixels. And that can be more abstract, going into a feature feature and uh, feature decision. And um, the higher you get, the more statistical it gets. So you're more looking at fusing tables of information and uh, a little bit more graphical overview of this is um, the workflow you have for, for the fusion. And uh, the first step is, of course, getting your images. And um, the images are most likely not aligned. So the first step is that you have to do the registration that we talked about last week. So in principle, just getting the images on the same grid and rotate them in the same way that they are matching up. Once you have done that, you can go on doing the pixel fusion, may need to do some further alignment and uh, calibration to get the gray levels on the same scale. And then you can compare pixel by, pixel by pixel. You could also go on then to the feature fusion uh, where you first extract your features and then do some, again, some calibration to get the levels on the same scale. And uh, then you compare different uh, regions that should com uh, be comparable or items that are comparable and try to fuse those. And uh, the final one is uh, looking at, first you have to do some kind of labeling of the objects in order to do your uh, fusion. This is the one I have actually seen least of in, um, in the different practical works. But um, the other two, they are actually used quite, quite a lot now. Um, yeah, and finally you have your fusion, uh, which then brings you on to either you do statistics and modeling from this data, or else you can also or actually both, you can also do some presentation or display of your data in a better way. And uh, of course, you can also misuse the, the method. So there is also something called catastrophic fusion. And uh, in principle, what it's about is that the information from the two through the fusion process actually cancel out the benefits. So one plus one is less than two. And that is something you don't want. Um, one thing is, don't do fusion just because you can fuse things, because you have two, two data sets. It does may not, not even make sense. So at least look, look out for if it makes sense to do it. Could also be that you have selected the wrong vari variables to confuse, or maybe even that the combination of information is too complex um, yeah, and the counseling I already said. So, the more chefs you have doesn't really need to mean that the soup is getting better. Usually the difference, uh, the opposite. And um, the first step now in, in the fusion is, as we talked about last week, having an image registration. And um, the registration we did last week was using data from the same modality, and that's quite straightforward, but if you have two modalities, they may not even show the same information. And you may not even have landmark fiducial points that you can relate between the two images. So you need c to come up with some uh, metrics or loss functions that actually take into account information from the both uh, modalities. 
And uh, well, here you can uh, manual or guided uh, registration. It's one option that is used quite often, in um, particularly in the interactive software. And then you can look into the automatic registration with some iterative optimization process. Then you need, of course, to think about the metrics that you're using to, to guide the optimization. Here is one um, example of um, qualitative fusion made by my colleague. Now today it's a little bit too bright, but it's um, it's a sword that was found on the on the bottom of uh, Lake Zug. Was very well preserved. It's um, not so badly corroded, and it's a combination of wood and metal. And uh, to be really bad, it was amalgam inserts with. Um, so that means mercury insets and x-rays just produced horrible um, streaks around every dot that was inserted. The wood, on the other hand, which is waterlogged, was the problem for the neutrons. But by combining the two in the reconstruction, he was able to do a very nice uh, tomography uh, to describe how were the components uh, of this sword mounted and then the experimental archaeologists tried to reconstruct, make a reconstruction out of this sword in the way that they did it at that time. And I think it's still on exhibition in um, the museum in Zug, but there was uh, a large exhibition around it where there were nice animations, etc. And uh, if we want to do our segmentation, then we look at our data. We have here, in this case, again, the X-rays and neutrons uh, from this uh, snail shell. And um, we just try to play with it a little bit and see what's happening. And when you do this registration, it's good to have a little bit visual feedback. And um, also for the visualization, when people want to, when you want to demonstrate why you're doing it, uh, and one visualization technique is to use a checkerboard where you interleaved show one or the other type uh, of image. And uh, so this little piece of code here actually does the mixing for you. So you will have one modality one in the bright ones and the modality two in the dark ones. And uh, when you combine it, it, then I really need to cover the window because otherwise you don't see it. No. Nope. Oh, wrong one. Sorry. Hope it's getting a little bit more visible. So, what you can see um, here, you have a little bit blue and black. Maybe you can see it better on your own screens uh, when you look at it later. But you can see nicely here how how the two modalities interact with each other when you. And also, it's a good uh, feedback when you have done your registration to see if the registration actually makes sense. Another way of doing visualization is color challenge mi mixing. And um, here you can use the three color channels, RGB, where you mix in uh, modality A, as red, modality B as blue, and then the last channel you can have as the average. Or if you have three different modalities, of course, you can have the third one as blue. And depending on which color channel you're using, now again, the light is not uh, beneficial to show it, but uh, uh, here I used um, red and green channels. Here I used blue and green channel, and here I used uh, red and blue. Red and blue is one that I like personally quite much because uh, that works very well with the uh, soil and geology samples. It turns out that if you put um, the x-rays on the, on the red channel and the neutrons on the blue channel, you can really get the feeling of having uh, water in some solid material. In other cases, you, can, you may use these. Um, 
This one is most commonly used because it's the first two channels, so you're just straightforward using those. Uh, but you get a quite toxic um, impression of the sample. So, that was those things about um, visualization. And uh, now we go towards the segmentation using bimodal data. And uh, usually when you uh, look at the histogram of some image, it may look just like this uh, orange line or yellow orange line. And um, it's not so easy to really do a segmentation on this. As you can see, there is also a great overlap between the two, which gives us a lot of uncertainty in the segmentation. If we now have two modalities, unfortunately, again, we have the same condition, but in this case, you can see that modality A has uh, the blue information on this side, and uh, modality two, uh, B has the blue information on this side. So the class sensitivity has flipped between the two, and, uh, but still, the each of these histograms don't show very much information. Uh, you, you, you have still a hard time doing the segmentation. Now, if you would show this as a bivariate histogram, where you take the histogram counts from each of the images, then these two rather difficult histograms turn into something with very nice separation and that is what we are going to use, or that is the reason why we are using this bivariate um, concept, that it's much, much easier to separate the classes than if you would use just a single modality. And um, an example is uh, roots in soil. Roots with neutrons are very visible because they contain a lot of water. And um, with x-rays, they are almost transparent compared to the soil. So what you can see here uh, in this um, magnified dropout, um, there is some kind of stone which is almost transparent to the neutrons, but with the x-rays, hey, where am I? I lost my pointer. Hm. It doesn't work. Ah, there it is. Ah, okay. Um, so. Uh, you can see here that it's almost transparent, but on this one, on the x-rays, it seems that it's some kind of denser material. The root, on the other hand, this bright part, is a hole in that image. So we really see that we have the flipped relation between the two modalities, and that is what we're going to use now in the segmentation. This bivariate histogram is not as nice as the two Gaussian blobs I showed before, but you can still see that we have a large peak here for the background, and uh, this is probably the soil. Then you have two small bumps in the histogram over here. This is the container, and uh, that is the root group. So now we can clearly see that we have different parts in this uh, image, and uh, that, as you can see from the two um, histograms on the sides, is not very easy to separate uh, just by plain segmentation of a single modality. This is in logarithmic scale, so uh, it's quite a blow up here to, to make this visible because the roots are quite underrepresented in the soil. What we can do is um, to work with the data. One is to work on hypothesis testing. So we have different hypotheses that we have. Um, the data is belongs to some um, probability dis distribution with some average and uh, covariance matrix. And then you have that for the different um, classes. You can do that by um, likelihood testing or something like that. Um, another way is also to work with um, different methods that we have seen already. So we have the k-means, which is a pure clustering, k-nearest neighbor, and regression requires that you have some training set, and of course also the neural network also requires some training, but they can all 
happily do it in if you uh, provide the data in a good way. The neural networks actually um, has shown quite nice results too. K-means, um, I'm not so sure if that works well with the roots. I think I tried it, but it didn't turn out very well. Um, and the other ones I honestly didn't try because I didn't have the training data at that point when I did this experiment. Um, but a new mo uh, way to do it is to use uh, Gaussian mixture models. It's also a kind of a, I would say, a it's definitely a supervised method because you need to do some training. And the idea is that you have a sum of Gaussians uh, with different shapes. And that can be one-dimensional or multi-dimensional, whatever. And um, so you have this sum where you have Gaussians and some mixing coefficient. And um, the idea is that we want to separate these two classes by fitting the Gaussian distribution to the scattered uh, point clouds. We had this data before, I think, more or less. Yeah, and anyway, these two blobs, uh, I think we had it with k-nearest neighbor. And um, if we would do the Gaussian mixture model fitting, with different number of classes. You can see that in the first case, you have two nice classes um, that are fitted. And probably this would be the right choice to use two classes with this. But just to test and see if you can do some overfitting or not, you can continue doing three classes. You see this one is then split into two. Uh, we still have that one. And with four classes, you start splitting more. Uh, with five classes, you start getting information in the in the bridge here, which probably doesn't make sense. So that would be the limit for how much you should uh, split it into many classes. Now another thing is, once you have these statistical information, you can um, work with classification distances. And the easiest one is that you have the centroid of your Gaussian. And then you compute just you have your and you have your point and you compute uh, the nearest uh, class that you have identified. So it's almost like the nearest neighbor, k nearest neighbor approach, where you look for uh, the distances of the centroids, and um, with that you'd make your decision. This is just pure point based, and if you want to do it more complicated. You can use the Mahanalubis um, distance, which also includes the covariance matrix of the classes. And then you have, uh, even though this point is m in the middle between the two classes, it's more likely that it's land in, in the purple class here. And that is then a little bit more um, specific. And if you have really much data, you can also go to Bhattacharya distance, which, well, has a quite ugly equation. But what it does is it also uh, looks at the covariance matrix of the data point you are comparing with. So that means you need to compute the statistics of the point you're using also. And then you can see the overlap, how much the, the two classes, the, the point itself overlap with the two classes. And that would bring us bring you to even better classification in one sense, but as you are looking now at the neighborhood around the point, you also lose uh, resolution when you do this um, comparison. So it's maybe a little bit too overdefined. So I, I would probably mostly use this approach. So comparing them, you have all three together here. We can see distribution of the classes, and uh, with the roots, I have done some uh, segmentation. So I first identified the classes I had in the histogram, and from that I could uh, compute uh, Euclidean distance uh, decision space, and the final segmentation looks something like this. Uh, what you can see is 
the problem that I have mentioned before, that if you have multiple classes, it's always a problem to know what, uh, what the, the transition regions are doing. So, for example, here, it looks like I have some soil outside of the container, but that's not true, because that is just from the uncertainty of um, the unsharpness from the imaging system. So that would have need to be improved. Another thing which is also showing up is a problem with artifacts. That is, um, with the X-ray images, I had some beam hardening. That means in the middle of the image, the image, uh, the same material is darker than out at the border. And that led to the confusi confusing um, decision that the roots are, are container because they're much brighter than uh, the other ones, um, than the more central ones. So um, that the message here is that to have nice flat images, so you really need to pay attention to problems like beam hardening correction, scattering correction, etc., in order to do a good uh, segmentation. Um, Another thing we could do with these uh, two modalities is do some kind of bivariate estimation. So the idea is that we have on each point, uh, we can set up some um, equation system where we have a sum of attenuation coefficients and thicknesses, and that gives you some response in the neutrons, and you have, again, attenuation coefficients and uh, thicknesses and that would give you some response in the X-rays. This is more like a hypothesis on how to work. It's not very easy to do it because of all the noise we have in the images, and uh, it's more like a dream to get there, but um, someday I may, may solve it. Um, one more point is that this second sigma here is um, the typical uh, labeling of the total cross-section for neutrons and, um, and the mu here is the attenuation coefficient that is usually used for x-rays. So if we would like to know more than two materials we would of course need much more pixels um, to get materi different materials and uh, the equation system will probably be much more complicated than um, what you The next thing would be to go the next step, and that is um, combining last week's lecture with the time series with the bimodal and getting time series with two modalities and seeing how a process evolves over time. And um, that is something we are doing at PSI and actually nowadays at several other places around the world at neutron sources that we have an, a second source, an x-ray source, installed together with the neutron beam. And uh, this, of course, also brings us in the topic of big data. So we are actually doubling the data uh, from the time series with having the two modalities. So here is also, again, very important that you can reduce the data soon and um, extract what you need in, in as few steps as possible to reduce the computational requirements. And uh, with that, I think we may break because I'm changing topic quite radically now. So let's have a break and um, see you soon. <laughs>